the baby evolution. So I'm going to take it a little bit extra. <laughs> More, I mean, so breakfast can be a day. But um, a lot of evolutionists say the Bible is a fa I know you. You always talk in my classes. And I'm always telling you. <laughs> Well, you always want to define your terms. Whenever you're in conversation with somebody, you don't want to beat them up. You want to understand them, right? So that they are willing, will understand, be willing to listen to you and understand you. So you want to define your terms. So we're going to define what's a fairy tale. Who is the best fairy tale writer that we know besides the Brothers Grimm? Oh, see, Hollywood. Oh, I would say J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, David. Uh, yeah, J.R. Tolkien, he actually defined a fairy tale. He said fairy tales are different from other kinds of stories. And fairy tales are not true, but you're asked to believe it anyway. So, in the Grimm's fairy tales, when the cat, the mouse, and the sausage keep house together, you're not supposed to ask how it's even possible. You're not supposed to question it. Just for the sake of the story, just believe it. Just, just for the story. I know. Sausage is supposed to start the fires. So I don't know how that's going to happen. But anyway, um, well, something that evolutionists have said, and it started with Darwin actually, um, is that if you just had enough time and chance, with chance and the laws of nature, anything can happen. So molecules of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and everything else that makes us eventually becomes this. Okay? And if you just had enough time, and the laws of nature, and chance, just along the way. Well, okay, what are the laws of nature? Laws of nature are things that, for which there are no exception. So, if I hold the ball out and, and drop it, is it ever gonna fall up? If I throw it way up in the air, where is it eventually going to fall? Down, right. If I go that way, it's gonna fall down, right? That's a law of nature, no exceptions. So, there are lots of laws of nature. So, we're going to talk about three laws of nature that apply to life. The first one is from information theory. I've never heard that before. It's actually uh, only about 100 years old since they started making computers. And there are certain laws for how computers work. Well, it's information, and that's what DNA is it encodes information. So, it applies for our purposes. And information said, information theory said, there is no universal information without an intelligent sender. Okay, so what is universal information? Universal information is something that is recognized as information by anyone. So if you're on a desert island, anyone here watch the, you know, dual survival and that kind of thing, and you're supposed to try and get saved and all those kind of things, what are you, what, is the, what do you do? To show somebody out there that you're here, please save me. Yes, go ahead. What? Flare. Flare. A fire. Flare. A flare? Flare or a fire. Well, yeah, that's true. But uh, something that's simpler, because not everybody can have a flare gun or has something that start fire. Um, three. Be loud. Say it. SOS. SOS. And SOS, believe it or not, means nothing. But what SOS is, is did S in Morse code is dit dit dit. O is da, dash, dash, dash. And then S again is dit dit dit. Three things, three times. Okay, so if all you have is rocks, rocks in a row, logs in a row, a triangle. Why? Because one is an accident, two is a coincidence, three is design. Everyone in the world recognizes that that is their own purpose, an intelligent center. Okay, the next one we use is the second law of thermodynamics. And that is really depressing. Everything is tending to disorder. That means uh, matter, energy, and information is all tending to disorder. This is your bedroom. Who clean? Okay, really. Who wants to suck up and say they cleaned their bedroom before they came? 
drive right, you drive through the tree. Um, uh, everything came from the same micro, little, little amoeba. Okay, one cell critter. And that one cell critter at one point in time was inorganic material, floating around. And then the inorganic material somehow came together, got zapped somehow, became a one cell critter. And then that one cell critter kept reproducing, and some of them went this way and became sequoias, and some went this way and became walruses, and some went this way and became jellyfish. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> but that's the def definition. Okay, biogenesis. Life only comes from life. There's part of the definition is it wasn't alive at one point, and now it's alive. Okay, second law of thermodynamics. All right, here's the baby. A little history, uh, history lesson on uh, evolution. Was Darwin the first person to come up with evolution? No. No, people have been talking about it for a hundred years. But one guy had this idea, one guy had this idea. They were just sort of batting them around trying to figure out how to get God out of the equation. And finally, Darwin. Came along, and one of the ideas, and he, in 1959, he wrote a book with, with the uh, title of "Wait for It: The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Quest the Struggle for Life." Can I have a, boy, a, boy, a round of applause? For that? <laughs> you know, the key in all of that is natural selection. He did not come up with that idea. A creationist come, came up with it. It was a pastor sitting in his study looking out at the field of the cows, and he went, my goodness, things that are able to, re to find food more successfully and are able to find mates are the ones that will reproduce, and the other ones will die out. Well, that matches the Bible, right? There, you, you can find fossils of things you're really glad we don't have anymore. Um, but Darwin used it as a mechanism for evolution because before that they couldn't figure out how it happened. Well, Darwin was not a scientist. He went out and he observed some things, but when he, he brought home thousands of dead birds, but he didn't know what they were. He couldn't tell the difference between a finch and a mockingbird, so he had to have an ornithologist you know, to evaluate what these things were. He was what is called a natural philosopher. That means he is thinking about nature. He's not actually doing anything with nature. And the problem with his theory of evolution, everyone's really gone to hell for it. Until about 1900, and everyone realized it, wasn't, it didn't work. They didn't see it work. They didn't see it in the fossil record. There are no transitional forms of one thing turning into another. So they were about ready to give up on it. And then somebody opened a closet, literally open closet, in a monastery in Germany. And they found hundreds of notebooks with the observations of thousands of generations of peas done by Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. And unlike Darwin, he has no interest in making a name for himself, but he had done actual science. And from his actual science, we get the Punnett Square. He had figured out that dominant and recessive characteristics in a certain way. So the dominant, the big, the big A, and the recessive, the little A, combine in different ways. And you can have a dominant dominant, or a dominant recessive, recessive dominant, or a recessive recessive. Okay, if, if you've taken biology, or you have seen this, and you will see it, it happens. So what happens here is that if you get a dominant from one parent and a dominant from another parent, you are dominant dominant. And if you, what? Dominant, dominant. And if you have a dominant and a recessive from one parent or vice versa, you know, um, then you, the dominant is what shows up, but you still have the recessive information. If you have the recessive and the recessive, then you don't have dominant information anymore. So this, a, the dominant, dominant, is why people in Africa all have brown eyes. There's just no recessive in there at all. And the recessive recessive is why Vikings only had blue eyes, gray eyes, like they had light eyes.
because they had no dominant characteristics. So in this process, what have we lost? What has happened? Lost information. So that's consistent with what we see. And everyone liked that idea, but then they were like, ha, ah, we figured it out. But the problem is, it only takes us a while because they realized that to get from an amoeba to a sequoia tree, you have to gain information. So how do you gain information? Because this only explains how you lose it. So they went, eh. And people were thinking for a long time until almost 1960, it was in the 1950s, that Watson and Crick discovered, what is this? Ha, yes, it's a beautiful thing. You can actually find artwork with the DNA one. Gorgeous. Does this look like universal information? Does any, everyone, if you look at this, everyone here, does this look like a blob that's sort of plopped onto the ground? Uh, does it look like someone designed this? Watson and Crick had a real problem with that. They said, it just has the appearance of order. Because they were real atheists, I mean real atheists. But this was the only way that it worked. They didn't actually see this. They didn't take a, a microscope picture of this until decades after. But they said this is the only way it can work. And it turned out they were right. So um, when they did, when they figured this out, everyone went, ha! Mutations! That's the answer! We have positive mutations and we get more information. Well, what's a mutation? Does anyone know what a mutation is? Yeah. No one. Disordered. I like that word. What happens is that whenever a cell divides, this strips apart into, you know, like what are that those candies that my kids like to get, the sour gummy ribbon things? It strips apart, but then and, and gets replicated, and then it gets sewn back together again in the next cell. And in the process of that replication, sometimes um, sections are repeated. And sometimes um, they, uh, they lose bits, they just fall off. And sometimes they get swapped. Did anything, is anything gained in that process? Even if you repeat the information, it's Still the same information. It's like, you know, when you put your finger on the X on your keyboard and it just goes, you know, it, you have not increased any, any information. You just have more of it. So, um, but if you ask any evolutionist, and I have got an entire book filled with quotes from evolutionists, and they will say, with beneficial mutations, we gain information, we can, they, they don't like to say gain information because the science isn't there. But what they say is with beneficial mutations, things change and become other things. But is the science there? Most mutations are not beneficial. They're sort of neutral until my mutation matches up with my, you know, with my husband's mutation, and you end up with a recessive recessive, and then it becomes deleterious. That means it can actually kill the animal or the person that has it. albinos, that is, de is detrimental because if you're an albino, oh my golly, my husband, my son had a picture of deer in the woods, a book of deer in the woods. And there was an albino buck. If there was ever anyone asking to be shot, it was that buck. And um, the cows with an extra leg, or the calves, two-headed calves, and a chicken with curly, you like chickens, right? A chicken with curly, curly feathers is not healthy at all. They do not live long. And so, so we have evolution, which says that there is no intelligent center. That life comes from non-life, and that everything is increasing in order, not decreasing in order. Does evolution follow any of the three laws? Does the Bible, or this creation point to the Bible, follow the three laws? Remember our fairy tale? It's not true, but you are asked to believe it anyway. Which one is the fairy tale? Evolution. 
very smart. That's right. And the only reason that evolution keeps getting taught at zoos and museums and school books is that the alternative is there has to be an intelligence element. Hey, Sham, is it true when they decoded the, uh, the DNA, they've been sequencing it and, and like unfolding it, that they see the name of God in it? Um, I have not, I've not heard that. I'm sure somebody, you know, like figuring out Bible codes and oh, I'm sure that someone can But anyway, um, we were talking, we had that song. I'm pretty much done, but her song, Revolutionary, it is getting to the point where to believe in the Bible is revolutionary. It really is. Because I, my son-in-law uh, got a, a master's degree and he was going to want to go and get a, uh, a PhD in genetics because he wanted to be a creation speaker. And he came from a creation school. And they wouldn't let him in. He had the grades, but they wouldn't let him in because he came from a creation school. So to the evolutionists have it locked up. Okay? And to stand up and say, it's just wrong is asking for real trouble. It's asking for real trouble. So the question is, are you willing to be a revolutionary?